it's it's a dinosaur. Uh -huh. <laughs> you get this terrible little book on it. Called Blood and it doesn't apply. They're totally wrong. This is a warm bodied creature. <laughs> this thing doesn't live in a swamp. This thing's got what a 25, 27 foot neck. Brachiosaur on 30. <laughs> I think that scene from Jurassic Park left a lot of us sitting there with our mouths open that they could do such a thing on screen and make it look like they brought them back to life. Did they ever exist? And if they did, why would God create them? Today we have John McKay back from Australia. He's a geologist. He's a creation research scientist. And he's got, I think, more of an evidence of uh, creation than ever any evidence of evolution was. And uh, we're glad to have him back. John it's McKay. good to be here again. It's good to have you back. We're going to talk for just a few minutes, and we're going to go mm -hmm. to a, just a little bit of a, a uh, devotional today. Good. But uh, last time you were here, we did Origin of the Races. We certainly did. Living fossils. <laughs> All sorts of things. And a brand new one. Yes, uh, we've had a tremendous response to that. I, I guess you can say that uh, Jurassic Park has done us a real favor. In fact, as I've, I've said on that video, which is a documentary done for TV, that my favorite line out of Jurassic Park, despite the fact that it's supposed to be about evolution, or evolution as you Americans say, yeah. um, is where that Scottish scientist who just rushed up there, proud of his creations as it were on the island there with those dinosaurs. He was very frustrated with the geologists who didn't believe what he was trying to do. And he said, creation requires a supreme act of will because every one of those dinosaurs, robots, whatever on that movie were actually created. And that's what the dinosaurs are all about. They, they are a reminder of the brilliance of God as creator. And we've had great fun with that um, documentary, Jehovah's Park, because it really isn't Jurassic Park, it's Jehovah's Park. It's the world that God made. It is. And uh, evidently, uh, going from this, uh, we had dinosaurs in the Garden of Eden. Is that right? We sure did. And Adam and Eve thought they were wonderful creatures, big and small and great and tall, you know, all right. <laughs> and no problem with them at all. Okay, well, we're going to find out more about them. Good. Let's go to our devotional today, and we've got a lot to talk about. He's brought some things with him to show you, even the claw of one of these big animals. We'll be right back. And our guest today, John McKay, goes all over the world talking about uh, creation versus evolution. And he's got a lot of evidence today that talks about the dinosaurs. Even the dinosaurs prove creation. How well, they surely do. And I'm sure the viewers out there feel pretty sorry for that little girl. I mean, imagine growing up with a name like Atheist Evolution oh, Rollinson. Wow. And, uh, you know, it's just a real comment on this nation on how people look at movies like Jurassic Park which supposedly are all about evolution and they build the future of America on this false past. So this poor little girl is going to grow up with a name that I don't think you'd like. No, I don't um, think so. But you see what it points out is that all of us build the future on where we think the past has been. And if we want to build a strong future for America's young people, you can't build it on a lie called evolution. And that young girl will find this out tragically in the future. So will her parents. So will this nation unless it gets back to looking at the facts that dinosaurs were created. Like if you have a look at the, the dinosaur beds in America, um, they are remarkable. There's an incredible amount of them. You can go from you know Saskatchewan, Alberta, in Canada, right down through Montana and Utah. In fact, after I left you last time, I was up in Montana digging up dinosaur bones. We had a marvelous time. But as you try and fit them into the evolutionary picture, you know, the idea that uh, once they weren't dinosaurs and then they became dinosaurs and then the dinosaurs died out, except for some of them who grew feathers and turned into pigeons that land on our shoulders and do nasty things. Um, as you try and look for the bones to show that happened, you can't find it. In fact, as I've said over and over again to students in this country, that's the very thing that convinced me that the Bible happened to be true when it said creatures were created to produce their own kind. You can find dinosaurs, you know, when you look through the rocks and they start off as dinosaurs. Even though most of them seem to have disappeared now, they never changed into anything. They certainly didn't change into birds. 
the silliest way to make a bird would be to start out with a reptile like a dinosaur because if you actually sit down and think about it a reptile you know like the ones we've got today crocodiles or snakes or whatever um, if you've ever watched a lizard breathe you'll notice that it breathes very differently than you and me or birds yes. because mm -hmm. lizards uh, when they breathe, they, their ribs go out because they don't have any muscles down here to actually do that. Mm -hmm. So what you'll find is if you tried to turn a dinosaur into a bird, you know, every time it flapped its wings, its ribs would go out, it would breathe in. Every time it flapped them down, it would breathe out. The faster it flapped, the faster it would breathe until the end. The air would be going in as fast as it came out and it would fall out of the sky because it wasn't getting any Probably air. Probably hyperventilated. It would be absolutely <laughs> hyperventilated. The brain would be heating up and blowing out of its ears. So what you'd find is in the rocks here in the USA, the evidence only shows dinosaurs starting out as dinosaurs. They didn't evolve slowly. And um, when you look at the number of dinosaurs and the brilliant design of them, you know, as I've said just in our introduction, the reason Steven Spielberg had to spend millions of dollars on those models is that if you've got to create a copy of something that the Discovery Channel says got here by chance, the reason is very simple. It got here by the same way you had to make a copy. You had to create the yes. copy because that's how the original a got here. A supreme act of will, that's as exactly they said the right in their own act film. Of will. Yeah. That's right. Okay. Yeah. Um, one of the other interesting things about dinosaurs is when you go digging them up, like here's a claw from a carnosaur that comes from Utah. Carnosaur. A carnosaur. That's a new word for you today, is it? Right, I like that, yeah. <laughs> it's an, it, well, it's you know one of these big ones that's supposed to be related to T-Rex and, and, uh, and all of that. Mm -hmm. And when you look at the claws of them, um, <coughs> well, the claws don't mean a great deal just by themselves until we tell you, look, in this quarry over there in Utah, there's at least 30 million dinosaur bones in an area not much bigger than a square mile. And what's most intriguing is that the dinosaur, the, the noses on the skulls of the dinosaurs that have been found amidst this huge pile are all pointing in the one direction. And I don't know if people caught it, but in one of the last week's news magazines, they reported the newest T-Rex that had been found. And the, the people who discovered it said, it seems to have been washed into a stream or a lake or in a flood. Well, Christians oughtn't to be surprised that these mm -hmm. animals are found First of all, their bones are, are fairly well preserved, and secondly, they, they've all been washed in. Because the Bible talks not only of creation, it talks of the fact that there was a destruction, and no wonder we find so many dinosaur bones and other creatures, they've all been buried quickly, so quickly, they didn't um, self-destruct, they, they were preserved. In fact, when people think about it, the only reason we've got fossils is that they were buried quickly. If they took uh, time to just die and fall down dead on dinosaur land, uh, you wouldn't have any dinosaur fossils at all. So not only is there remarkable evidence of creation, there's remarkable evidence that this world has been destroyed by that flood the Bible talks about as Noah's flood. In fact, tomorrow I'll be spending all day in a public school. It's been remarkable to see how the doors are opening even in the schools. We had a phone call from uh, Albany and uh, the, the teacher at the other end said, look, I've got our principal here. Can you come and address our whole school for the whole day? Phew, what an opportunity. Really? So we'll be taking the dinosaurs to the boys and girls tomorrow, to the students, and spending the whole day with the school. It's just a remarkable opportunity. In fact, the schools in Tennessee are doing that too. It's been hard for many years, but at last the doors are opening so the people out there can pray for us because the kids need to hear the evidence mm -hmm. dinosaurs were created. Well, there's more things going on too. You know, we had some wow. good news with our elections this yes, last yes. Uh, week or so, but uh, you had some good news downtown here too. We certainly did, too. yes. Um, being involved in geology, every time I come into town, one of my colleagues, Bob Powell, who's a government geologist, hauls me in and says, speak to my colleagues. So we started out with a little crowd about five years ago, or four or five people, and it's grown and grown and grown. And last time we were down in the, um, the government building down there, and we filled up the, the conference room on the topic of catastrophic geology, the evidence the rocks didn't take millions of years. Well, obviously, you can't get bigger and bigger meetings in these sort of places without attracting attention, mm -hmm. particularly when the questions people ask you, well, where does creation fit into this? What about Noah's flood? It's interesting how the geologists know all about these things, even though technically they're not supposed to believe in them. And so um, in the last six months or so, there's been quite a bit of opposition behind the scenes particularly with the standard American line, you know, separation of church and state, you can't bring this religious stuff in here. And uh, what's been a real victory is the lawyer's advice has been, well, they can't stop you. 
So it's been now made a wide open door. We've got the freedom to use the buildings down there to talk to the geologists. It's just been a marvellous victory. And so well, I'll be down there this Friday talking to the geologists on catastrophic coal and Noah's flood. And uh, it really is great just to see the way the Lord is opening doors. So there's another thing the viewers out there can pray for us as we, we work with some of the leaders of the, the technical fields here in the USA. You know, a lot of, a lot of Christians, I think, uh, are a little afraid of that, that whole thing because they talk about, I mean, the dinosaurs, because they talk about dinosaurs having been like way predated people on the earth and that 65 million years, as the movie was saying, is that the case? Is, did we not walk on the earth with dinosaurs? Well, when you look at the record of God who was there rather than the stories of Steven Spielberg who wasn't there, what you find is the Bible talks about the creation of all things. And it talks about God making the creeping things, God making the swimming things, the flying things. And people forget that when the word dinosaur was first invented, it meant the man who originated was a person who believed in creation you know, even that's left out of the textbooks these days, but he was Richard Owen, the man who was the founding director of the British Museum, a brilliant geologist, and he meant by the word dinosaur, big and fearful creeping creatures. So you can read about the big and fearful creeping creatures from Genesis mm -hmm. chapter 1, verses 25 onwards. So dinosaurs and Adam and Eve were all there together, and in case you're worried that, you know, they were going to be eaten up by Carnosaurs or Tyrannosaur Rex, no, not in the first world. The Bible is emphatic that those animals, whether they were lions or tigers or T-Rexes, or lambs. everything, or lambs, they yeah. all ate plants. Mm -hmm. um, Christians ought to be surprised at that because the Bible talks about a time once again when the Lord will remake the heavens and the earth and the lion will once again lay down with the lamb mm -hmm. and they'll both mm -hmm. eat grass. In between, of course, we've got tigers that rip your arm off and, and dingoes in Australia that nibble on your toes. And we tend to forget that the Bible reminds us, it's a very blunt book. It says that when we sinned, even the animals have been affected. Mm -hmm. So from the time of that beautiful Garden of Eden state where even T-Rex sort of was a coconut eater, um, what you've got is a degeneration of the animal world till now mosquitoes suck our blood instead of sucking the sap out of plants to get what they need, where t tigers rip your flesh to pieces instead of chewing um, the grass like the Bible says one day again they will when sin is finally removed sin from this place. Sin brought death to the earth. Sin has mm -hmm. brought death mm -hmm. to this world and it really is tragic. In fact you can see it even in the lives of the young people if you just go through the schools today and count up the number of young people who are committing suicide. You know, if, if they brought up on evolution, everything happened by accident, there's, it, we just got here by chance. And the tragedy is there's no hope out there for them. If chance got us this far, chance has made a mess, there's no hope in the future, so I might as well blow my brains out. And it really is tragic as we work with the young people to see that there's no hope out there. So again, we're just praising God for the open doors because it's the only way to put hope back in there to remind them there is a God who created and He cares so much He became the Saviour Jesus Christ who died in their place to take that death and sin away. Yes. You know, this man, uh, Mr. Owen, he, uh, he evidently named the dinosaur, but did he find one? And where, do we, where does this all go back to? I mean, it didn't, it didn't occur to me until just this last week that at some point we decided there had been these big uh, mm -hmm. leviathans. Yes, Richard Owen uh, lived in the same time as Charles Darwin. Charles Darwin was not a geologist, mm -hmm. Richard Owen was. So it's not surprising that the geologist um, you know, who knew about bones argued with Darwin who really didn't because Darwin gave us a theory of evolution and people tend to think it's based on the fossil evidence. Well, go back to the time when it was first being originated to find it was the scientists who opposed Charles Darwin, mm -hmm. particularly men like Richard Owen. But it was Richard Owen who invented the word dinosaur and no, he wasn't the first man to discover them. Um, he actually got his collection from a doctor, a medical doctor who went bankrupt, who really was into bones. And fortunately, mm -hmm. digging them up rather than mending them, that's the reason he went bankrupt. But he did make some money out of his bones because Richard Owen's museum paid £4,000. Today, that's probably about thirty or $40,000 for his collection of, of, um, of dinosaur bones. But they weren't called dinosaurs yet. Mm -hmm. Richard Owen studied these and said, you know, they look like the bones of big lizards. We don't have any big lizards this size around. Mm -hmm. And so he came up with this new word, dinosaur. And that's now 152 years ago. 
152 yeah, it's years. a long time. Well, let, let's, let's go back to where they found these big bones. Did anybody have any theory about them uh, um, and, and about what may have created mm -hmm. them back then? Well, Richard Owen was sure that they were the monsters that God made. In fact, that's why he argued to his dying day with Charles Darwin. In fact, if you just hold up our video we've just made on Jehovah's Park, you'll see we've used that little byline at the bottom, Jehovah's Park, the monsters God made. Mm. And uh, we'll be putting up our phone number later on where folks can get these from and they can just leave a message on the answering machine because I think the office is empty at the moment, we're all out. But um, they'll, they'll get your message if you're interested. Mm -hmm. And if you look at these, the bones were all found in mud or limestone or sediment mm. um, that had been washed in. So one oughtn't to be surprised that the first geologists, who basically were Christians, said, well, look, these are the remains of animals that were destroyed at the time of Noah's flood. And basically, that's where we're getting back to. Um, some of them survived after the flood, of course, because I'm sure Noah had two of each kind on board. But um, as we come from the time of Noah's flood to the present, we've got to again remember what the Bible says has happened to the world. Um, you're um, a fairly attractive young lady, but you see, back in Abraham's I like the young day, part. That's yeah, nice. young Thank is you. fine. <laughs> Abraham's wife Sarah was still an attractive young lady at 90 years of age, and Eve was still an attractive lady at 900 years of age. You know, from the time of creation down to the present, the world has degenerated to the point where we no longer live as long, and neither did the monsters like dinosaurs. Crocodiles are still here because they live in the water. They've been much more protected than the monsters that lived on the land. But crocodiles don't get as big as they used to be. You know, they only live to be 100, so they get to be about 20 or 30 feet at the most. Mm -hmm. um, the ones in the rocks are 52 feet long. Dinosaurs in the rocks are 50 to 60 feet long, but they're not even here anymore because I'm pretty sure after the flood, they didn't live as long, they didn't grow as big. As we migrated out from the Middle mm -hmm. East, they got in our road, they were getting smaller, we were getting bolder and we more numerous, so we years. bumped them off, but we called them dragons in those days. Oh, good. Well, let's so that's where it all fits together. Let, let's talk about those dragons a Very little bit. Good. That was so interesting when I was, I was reading or uh, watching your video about that, that, that uh, we always thought of those as myths or legends. Yeah, we sure did. In fact, you know, when I was brought up, I don't come from a church family background, I would have, you know, categorized um, da, uh, dragons and creation all in the same fairy story realm. But the more I've traveled around the world, um, the more I've interviewed many of the native races, the more I've looked up all the old records. In fact, my family comes from Scotland. It's funny when you go back to my hometown in Scotland, the phone book is entirely full of Mackays, or Mackays as you say, it's absolutely useless, you don't know who you're ringing up. But over there you'll find that in Scotland you can find the printed records of the death of the last dragon because it, it didn't happen until about three or four hundred years ago. And it's written down in the history books as the last dragon in Scotland was killed by such and such and such and such a day. And that's just not like a myth. Myths don't normally have dates and times and places and mm -hmm. names mm -hmm. in them. And if you go to Germany, you'll find the same thing. So that people like Attila the Hun and that are actually recorded as being involved in the death of the last of these dragons. Um, when you come to North America, you find no matter which Indian group you talk to, like the, the Sioux people used, used to have a story, in fact, they still have a story, about this huge lizard that flew through the sky and uh, it was struck by lightning, fell to the ground, and uh, when they, they found it, it had claws on its wings. Are we talking like the pteranodon or pter well, pterodactyl? Well, you know, in our mind, a lizard with claws, you go to the museums and you see these big pterodactyls or pterodons, you know, and the description is amazing. Mm -hmm. You know, from people who've never sort of been to museums or studied these, that they would come up with such a story mm -hmm. that you and I would say, well, that's a dinosaur, that's a pterosaur, or, you know, the Loch Ness Monster, just all the descriptions are uh, in the plesiosaur bracket. And the Loch Ness Monster wasn't just invented to get American tourists to Scotland because the first Christian missionaries wrote down the records of the stories of the people who were already there, you know, 14, 1500 years ago, and they still told exactly the same stories about these big monsters with long necks that lived in the lakes. And were they fire breathers? Were they fire breathers? Dragons well, in my stories were, were always fire breathers. Well, I don't think the Loch Ness Monster would have been a fire breather. It wouldn't have been much use in the water. <laughs> But it is true, um, whether you look at the stories from secular sources or even in the Bible, 
There's a marvellous description in the book of Job of a monster that was covered in scales, that had a mouth, you know, that was unbelievably big in size and full of sharp teeth. You see, by the time of Job, who lived around about the time of the Tower of Babel, he was still living till he was 400 or so years of age, so the, the monsters were still getting to be fairly big. And in fact, the monster in Job is described as not only as having such savage teeth, it's covered with jagged scales that left a mark in the mud as it, it uh, went. It was so big, nobody could kill it, and that breathed fire. You know, and Christians need to come to grips with the fact that this is the same book that says Jesus healed a man's withered arm. It talks about a monster that breathed fire. Now, we've got a, a few animals today that still breathe superheated things, and, and we, we, we tend never to hear about them much. But in Australia, we've got this little beetle, and, you know, you can put it in your hand and you'll hear bang, bang. And when you look at your hand, you'll see little burn marks everywhere. And this little creature uses that, that, that superheated gases to defend itself against other insects these days. Whether it once used it to take off from the ground or what, I don't know. But it certainly can burn you. <laughs> like because, a reverse jet. Yeah, like a that? reverse jet, that's <laughs> right. Well, actually, it can turn this jet in any direction. It's far oh, more yeah. sophisticated than our jet planes, who are sort of go, they go up or they go down, uh, but it can't, they can't turn their jets in any direction. This little animal can and it emits superheated gases. Mm -hmm. And so if beetles can do it, then big bug-eyed monsters could do it once upon a time too. And when you d have a look at the, the skulls in museums, what I'd encourage the people that, who are doing, the, the young people out there, have a look at some of the dinosaur skulls because they'll find there's not only nostrils in them, there's other cavities as well. And normally you'll read the story, it says we're not quite sure what these cavities were for, Perhaps they were for making noises as the dinosaurs mated, you know, or you know, making boom, boom, boom noises like frogs do. Mm -hmm. um, perhaps they were used for storing the ingredients that when they were emitted would become superheated gases and hence our accounts in the Bible and other books that said they were fire breathing. And, yes. uh, you know, that's what the Bible has to say, and it's in the stories all around the world, too. All right. Well, there's even stories about Chinese dragons and, and whatever. I, uh, this is really fascinating to me. we got so few times, so there's little time yes. whenever you're here, and we're, we're going to give away some things. Uh, we are, too, yes. A little later in the show. Yep, we'll do that. And uh, so they've got to stick around. This is an hour-long show today, and we've got more things to show you, some fossils that he's brought from Australia and some other places around the world, and we'll find out more about his schedule, but uh, let's go to a break right now and we'll be right back. Where dinosaurs really like that. How do we know what they look like? <laughs> well, it certainly looks impressive on, on Jurassic Park, doesn't it? And yeah. uh, I was really thrilled when the robot companies gave us permission to film all their robots, and, and it really is, is great. But mm -hmm. how do we know what they look like? Well, I brought along a couple of fossils to help us answer that question. You can hold them up for the viewers. I was just in Wales last week and um, collecting rocks and fossils, and that's a beautiful little one. Um, it's, it's just a shell. Can we get the picture of that up there so folks can see what we're talking about? Just about coming up soon. And when you dig up a whole shell like that, then it's very easy to say what they look like. Um, of course, there was an animal in that shell that came out of the, the bottom part, and that's not there. So you could guess what the animal looked like, even though you know what it lived in. Now, in cases like this one here, there's another one there you find that's a trilobite. I bought, we just ran a field trip in Canada and we had students and science teachers and all that and that trilobite there is fairly easy to figure out what it looked like because the whole thing is impressed into it. Mm -hmm. And so you've just got a, a, a mould of it and so if you filled that up with plaster and took the plaster out, you'd have a beautiful copy of exactly what the animal was like. Okay, now you had another piece. Yeah, I did. In fact, this. this is exactly the opposite side. So there's a natural mould um, that's the animal itself that's on this one, and it's left the mould. This actually was like It was this. like that, and we split it apart, and the students took home heaps of these. It was a great reminder. These, these little trilobites have got three parts in them, and even the eyes are preserved. 
-hmm. and you can pull the lenses out and actually look through them and uh, you know they have all the brilliance of the same sort of optical precision in some of these cameras we've got in the room at the moment mm -hmm. so there's the brilliant evidence of God as creator okay. but see there's two different sorts of fossils that we picked up so far one is where only the shell, the outside part, was preserved, and you have to guess what the animal's like. The other is where the whole animal's there, and it's impressed in the mud. Pull it apart, you can see the outside, you can see the inside, and you actually pull it apart and find out exactly how the animal's working. Now, how do we know from, from do, do we have an intact dinosaur, or do we especially have an intact a T-Rex? dinosaur? Well, we have T-Rexes nearly, right? We've been getting um, bigger and better specimens, uh, of T-Rexes, but you know, I was just reading a new science magazine yesterday, it said, uh, with the latest discoveries, what have we had to change about T-Rex? Most people, despite the fact you see lovely big T-Rexes on Jurassic Park, don't realise up until recently we'd never even found the funny little arms on, on the T-Rex skeleton. Mm -hmm. We'd never found the whole tail. So that these ideas were borrowed off other dinosaurs and sort of uh, a mixture of a jigsaw of this dinosaur and that dinosaur to make up a final T-Rex. And so this author, who's quite a notable scientist, said, with our latest discoveries, we've discovered the arms are even shorter than the ones that have been on the traditional model. You know, the cute little arms that T-Rex is supposed to have. Mm -hmm. and, and hinted in there, of course, is the fact that if you don't find a whole skeleton, then your picture is, at best, an educated guess. At worst, it's just fantasy. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. if you can think about that, that new T-Rex, you know, with the much shorter arms and things like that, and we're still trying to figure out whether you had two claws or three claws. We haven't found everything yet, as far as I'm aware. Um, most people don't realize the monsters shown on, on, say, Jurassic Park couldn't even reach down to put anything in their mouth. Yeah, couldn't reach his mouth. And he, he couldn't hold anything to bite its head off. And the fact of the matter is, despite the way T-Rex is presented, when you actually dig up the fossil teeth, the fossil jaws, what you find is an animal that couldn't have ripped your head or my off, head off if it tried. Its teeth were so fragile they would have fallen out. At best, T-Rex would have been a scavenger. Um, you know, when you have a look at the biblical description, all of the animals started off as harmless vegetarians. And the evidence from animals like T-Rex tells us that they weren't designed to be killers in the first place. Some of the dinosaurs we only know from a couple of bones. Mm -hmm. And so you can mm -hmm. say without a shadow of a doubt, all those lovely big pictures in the picture books for children are just fantasy. Mm -hmm. But when you get the um, pictures of T-Rex with yellow spots here and black spots there, they're making it up. When they're going, they're make, you don't dig up noises they in the no rocks. They have no idea. They have no idea. So yeah. you can probably say, even if you had a whole skeleton, what the animal does, what you make it eat, is all just super, um, supposition, it's all just theory, not fact. Okay, well, this whole Noah's Ark theory now, I, you, we want to go back and put yeah. that in a little perspective, because I think most people, uh, if they think about dinosaurs at all, they probably think they just died out in the flood. There weren't any on Noah's Ark, if they ever even thought mm -hmm. about that. I did, it hadn't occurred to me that he put any on the mm -hmm. Ark. I thought they would have been too big. <laughs> Well, if you'd have already watched our Jehovah's Park, or the viewers had their own copy, and uh, we'll remind them again, we'll put our phone number up that they can ring a little later on. We actually got one of our computer graphics experts to put a model of the ark there and show how big the dinosaurs were in comparison. In fact, he did quite a good job. He did it better than I even thought yes. of. You know, he has Ma and Pra Triceratops walking up, the whole family of Triceratops, and then when they get to the bottom of the plank, of course, Ma and Pa just say goodbye to the little ones, and the little ones go yes. up the plank. Because what most people miss is that dinosaurs started out that big. You know, dinosaurs like crocodiles start out as eggs you could, you could hold in your hands. Mm -hmm. And Noah had no reason to take big ones on board, but we must remember the Bible says that God sent two of every kind of creature every to kind. Noah. And it's not a problem. They didn't have to swim across oceans or anything because the description of the world in Genesis is of a place where the water is in one place. Mm -hmm. So there was no 75% ocean separating continents like we've got in this degenerate world that we live in by comparison. The water was all in one place, so no matter where the animals lived, they had no trouble walking to where Noah was, and there was no reason for Noah to take big, strong, old ones on. Just strong, healthy um, baby ones would have been far more suited mm -hmm. And if you're worried about how Noah had to feed all these animals, I have to puzzle about you know, how to keep all these animals going for a year and 10 days on the ark. Mm -hmm. And as part of that video project, we went to crocodile farms. 
And um, there's one crocodile farm we went to. It's run by a friend of mine, Robbie Breddle. And he was telling us crocodiles are contrary creatures because, you know, they are cousins of dinosaurs. They're still here. And he was saying he caught a big one which he was transporting back to his farm. And he said, if you catch them, they, they, they do a tantrum. They take the sulks. Mm -hmm. And he said, they won't talk to you, make any noises. They'll just put their head in the sand virtually. And he said, we had one that refused to eat for 18 months. Now, after 18 months, you and I would be sort of whisked away. I'd probably fact, be down to the yeah, weight I wanted to be. Yeah, yeah. probably down the weight you wanted to be. <laughs> or in two weeks and you'd be down the weight you wanted to be. But when you have a look at the crocodiles, he said after 18 months of not eating, he said it looked like you and me after a diet of a couple of weeks. And, uh, you know, even the baby yes. crocodiles can go for four or five months without food because they store it in their tails. So I'm pretty sure that dinosaurs would have done exactly the same. So even if Noah took a couple of year old dinosaurs on board the ark, there was no problem in feeding them. They, they went already prepared with the food store in their tails. Okay, by, then, by this time uh, in history then, would they have, since they, this was after the fall, mm -hmm. would they have been a violent animal and why would he have wanted to mm -hmm. take them if they already were dangerous? I'm pretty sure that by the time we got to Noah's flood, some of the animals had become violent mm -hmm. because the biblical record tells us that God sent the flood for two reasons. One is because all people had become wicked except for Noah mm -hmm. and the second is because all flesh which covers the animals as well had become violent. doesn't say they'd started to eat each other yet but they had started to become violent mm -hmm. and in case you're wondering how such a thing would happen you know just think of the way people bring up dogs if you get a bad dog owner, yes. then you'll end up with a bad dog. In fact, you can take a good dog and give it to a bad person, and the dog will end up mean and nasty and rotten and terrible. Um, we tend to forget that our, our um, nature is reflected in how the animals react to us, and if we, we treat them terribly, they'll react badly to us. But I'm pretty sure by the time of Noah's flood, as the Bible says, the animals have become violent, but I don't think it's still much later that many of them had actually become carnivores. Mm -hmm. In fact, some of them we know have only become carnivores in the last century. We know it because we've watched it happen. Mm -hmm. You know, we've got an animal in New Zealand, the kia, which a hundred years ago we knew, we watched it, it was a vegetarian. Mm -hmm. And then we took all of its native food away, turned the land into farms, and this animal had two choices, find something else to eat or die out. Well, it chose something else to eat. Now it kills all the farmer's sheep. Now it never ate meat a hundred years ago. Mm -hmm. Now it does. Whose fault is it? Ours. Right? So okay. we've taken a vegetarian and we've made it into a carnivore by um, changing its environment to the point where it had nothing else to eat. Now I'm, I'm assuming that, that you're saying by, by him asking, by God asking Noah to take uh, one or two of each, you know, two kinds, then these were not eggs that went on. They were actual little dinosaurs. No, because the Bible says God sent them to him. If they were eggs, Noah would have had to go and collect them. <laughs> right, <laughs> so, right. So they so all they... walked on board under their own steam. Okay. Now, they were on board for mm -hmm. over a year, something like a year. And, Ten days. Uh, but how, how big does a dinosaur grow in a year? Well, if you have a look at crocodiles, crocodiles will start off about that big. And depending on the species, you know, after a year, they may be a couple of feet long. Um, they, they don't finish growing for another 20 to 30 years in terms of reaching their adult size, you know, of about six or seven or eight feet long. Mm -hmm. And then after that, they will still keep growing. You know, and by 100 years, they may be up to 20 feet long, again, depending on the variety of crocodile that you've got. Evidently, they don't stop growing, is that? No, they don't stop growing as long as they live. So when you're looking at the, the difference between the baby ones and the big ones we find in the rocks, the fact is what you're looking at is evidence the Bible is true because the bigger they are in the rocks, the older they were. In fact, you know, the, the, the crocodiles we've got today, the biggest one on record was about 33 feet long, about 300 years of age, but the biggest one in the rocks is 52 feet long. Mm -hmm. So therefore, the evidence is that these animals once lived vast ages, just like the Bible says people did. Mm -hmm. um, but when you have a look at the crocodiles, the dinosaurs, crocodiles, Noah didn't have to take on the ark because they were having a wonderful time out in the, the water, flood. just yeah, and they, fish, whatever. Yeah, just the, the, the fish and the crocodiles and the ducks and the, they didn't need to go on board the ark at all. But land animals, like many of the dinosaurs, would have, but even by the end of the first year, they wouldn't have been all that big.
All right, they said the springs welled up from the mm -hmm. inside of the earth. Would that not have caused such a stir that even fish could not swim in it? Well, it certainly would have caused a stir. When you look at the way the Bible talks about the flood, it just didn't rain for 40 days and then dry up and go away. It's a much more catastrophic activity. In fact, as I'll be in with the geologists on Friday, we'll be talking about the absolute devastation of Noah's flood. Mm -hmm. uh, we have one forum which I did in Oxford, if anyone out there is interested in technical material, you know, more than just the, the ordinary sort of general story of Noah's Flood. Mm -hmm. We did a forum on is there any evidence for Noah's Flood for the Geologists Association and as part of that we had to remind <coughs> them the Bible says the earth broke open, the fountains yes. of the deep came out. Now the water was inside because on the first and second day of creation when God raised up the dry land the water that used to cover the earth went from outside to inside. So the world before Noah's Flood is radically different than the one we're living in now. Mm -hmm. God left one patch of water on the outside and then when that world began to break up the water came from inside to the outside so the earth which was the outside began to go inside. So mm -hmm. it's not a problem of you know raining them up to sort of cover Mount Everest, you were bringing the mountains down to where the water was coming up to. And then by the time the rain had finished, by the time the water had finished coming out from inside the earth, remember in all of this You've got incredible amounts of mud coming in, so yes, many of the fishes were going to be killed. Okay, now you don't believe that this was 65 million years ago, that uh, if the creation account is, is of course true, then, then maybe these big dinosaurs lived only as long ago as man was created, which might be six, seven thousand years. Yes, I don't believe in 65 million years anymore. In fact, some of the fossils that we've got here sort of give it away. If you just hold that one up, We've still got creatures in the world that um, are beautiful descendants of that, the nautilus creatures, and their shells are so fragile, um, and if you think about them living and dying and falling to the bottom, unless they got buried quickly, the shells are just going to crumple up and crack. Mm -hmm. But you find millions of these shells in the rocks in nice layers, and you know, you can say, well, if that took a long time to actually get there, all those shells would be crushed and cracked, mm -hmm. but they're beautifully preserved because the rocks were laid down quickly. Mm -hmm. In fact, we took a um, group of people out, a whole busload of people out last Saturday. Beautiful day, wasn't it? Uh, it was just magnificent to see the fossils here in Tennessee, mm -hmm. and some of them, you know, up to 30 feet tall, some of the fossil trees, and they were buried so fast that you stand there and say, well, that can't be millions of years, because if it was, the tree would rot and fall over. Right. So the rocks don't <laughs> talk about millions of years. The people in the schools and the textbooks do. Okay. And, and it gives people a total wrong impression about the age of when these dinosaurs were. The fact is, if you go even to the Grand Canyon and say, well, look, if I take these fossils and the fossil had to be buried by the end of the week or it'd be rotted away and wouldn't be there, how much rock have we actually got in the total Grand Canyon? The answer is about 300 to 400 days worth, not 300 wow. to 400 million years worth. So the rocks don't talk of millions of years. The rock record talks of creation and then mass destruction by water. Okay, now according to what you're saying, these things were on the ark, and so then man was responsible for destroying many of them, mm -hmm. known as dragons. Yeah. And so there were dinosaurs on the earth yep. after I'm the flood. I'm pretty sure the, the biblical description of the animals in there, in the book of Job, is a reminder that what we used to call dragons is the old word for the new word dinosaur. Okay, now and can we, let's, let me get this question in, because uh, Jurassic Park would have us believe that uh, the DNA of a dinosaur was left in a rock of some kind inside the in the blood of a mosquito and then when incorporated with the DNA of a frog it became a big thunder lizard again. <laughs> okay, what, what's yeah, the possibility the of that? The possibility of that at the moment is zero, zilch, absolute not, none whatsoever. In fact, built into the idea that you can actually extract the DNA is the proof that the dinosaurs weren't here 65 million years ago. Because you, you actually can get some DNA, you know, the genetic material, out of the rocks and that. But if you put it in the laboratory and, you know, get fresh DNA and measure the rate at which it falls to pieces, you'll find it falls to pieces so fast that after 65 million years there'd be none in the rocks. So the fa mere fact that you can find fragments of it tells you it hasn't been here that long. Mm -hmm. But no, we're not clever enough yet to take the little bits we've got 
join them together with frogs, TNA, and remake monsters. If we ever did, all it would prove was that it took a creator the second time because it took a creator the first time. We know very well, and the movie is quite specific, it only happened when somebody intelligent actually set out to recreate the dinosaurs. On purpose. On purpose. Okay, well, let's look at a little clip from uh, Jehovah's Park here, uh, as opposed to uh, Jurassic Park. This is a wonderful, wonderful video, the newest in a series of John McKay productions, and it does have some pictures of the mechanical dinosaurs. And uh, let's, let's uh, tell us what we're going to be looking at. You're on the Well, we take you out to the field to actually show you the rocks and the dinosaur bones and try and answer the question, were these rocks 65 million years in the making or did they get there much quicker? It's All a right. great time out, so let's look at it. All right. We're going we're gonna to come back just for a minute here because so we couldn't find the audio on the Doesn't on the seem thing. like we better run our competition, huh? I think we should. Let's I, do that. I, I've got an article here that was sent to me from Murfreesboro. I believe that's here in Tennessee. It's a cutout of a newspaper. It says the Hubble telescope has just given us a clue to the universe's age. The problem is the Hubble has got us into trouble again because the latest information suggests that the universe is only half as old as the stars. Oh, good. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> it's like you being 20 Even and 40 on the same That's day. Yes, possible. that is a problem. And now, um, of course, if people believed the word of God who was there and the opinion of scientists who weren't, they would know that it was God who created the universe, built into it his written signature. And so here's my question. If folks win it, um, folks ring in with the answer, which is a Bible reference, We'll not only give you a great book on the weather, weather in the Bible, but there's another one by the same physics professor called Astronomy in the Bible. So if you want to have all the answers to deal with the questions kids come home and ask about the Big Bang Theory or the Hubble Telescope, then you'll find them all in here. And here is the question, um, where in the Bible does it tell us the universe can never be measured? Okay, that's the aim of the Hubble telescope, to measure the universe. Where in the Bible does it tell us the universe can't be measured? If you're the first person to ring in with the right Bible reference, then we'll send these to you. Um, so better put them back on the, bit, on the view there. And uh, you'll find these a great help with you young people. And we also have heaps of other books on dinosaurs and that. But these are the ones that are going for our prize today. Okay, and while you find those answers, we're going to go back and try that one more time, this time with audio. Morning here in New Zealand. The tide's out on the rocks, and the experts say these rocks are supposed to be about 140 million years old, just before the Cretaceous period. We're going to go for a walk through time today, right up to the end of where the dinosaurs are found. Or well, they estimate it would take about 65 million years, but I reckon we'll be back before the tide comes in. It's a little tiring walking through some 50 million years in just 20 minutes. Still we're up to the Lake Cretaceous and look what's in the rocks. Heaps of dead reptile bones all being washed in here. Still we've got about 10 to 20 million years to go so we'd better move. Well, that took us about 10 minutes to get through the last 10 or 20 million years. Actually, we've come about 65 to 70 million years in all of about 30 minutes. That's pretty good going, about 2 million years every minute on the average. That's if the time is real. See this layer I'm sitting on here? This is a really important layer. It's regarded as the end of the Cretaceous period worldwide. Below this line, the rocks are full of the bones of dinosaurs and plesiosaurs. But above this line, you can't find a single mosasaur or plesiosaur or dinosaur of any sort of sort. Um, the reason you can actually see these rocks is the cliffs have all been eroded away by the sea. So you're actually looking into the rocks themselves. But if I was to take a drill and drill down through this layer here, 
I would have to drill for about a third of a kilometre till I got to the same rocks that we were standing on that were exposed right at the other end. You remember the ones that are supposed to be about 140 million years old? Actually, that raises a good question. That means that third of a kilometre of rocks really took somewhere between 65 and 70 million years to be laid down. But if that's the case, I wonder how come it's full of dead creatures. Because everybody knows that if an animal dies on the beach or dies in the sea, unless it gets buried real fast, it's not going to be preserved to turn into a fossil. But these rocks, they're stuffed full of fossils from one end to the other in most cases. And if that's the case, the animals must have been buried fast. The mud and sediment must have been washed in quickly. And if it was, the evidence for all those millions of years, it's not in the rocks, it's in people's heads. In people's heads, all right. Well, one thing we didn't put in your head was the phone number for the station here, and it's 7540039, so that you can maybe win one of these or both of these books. Both of these today. Both yes. of them today. Yes. And the question again was? The question again is, where in the Bible does it tell us the universe can never be measured by us? They've got to give the right reference, and those, there's our phone number there now. And if they get it right, we'll send them these books and all the other free things we've got in our stock. Of course, can I tell folks where we're going to be on Thursday night? No, I hope so. I want to know your itinerary. Good, because yes. I'm, well, I've got schools all day in Kentucky tomorrow, so I'll be back here in Tennessee on Thursday. But on Thursday night at 7 o'clock, we have a wonderful program at Christ Community Church in Franklin. That's not far from here. It starts at 7 p.m. We'll be looking at the, the, the six days of creation, particularly the emphasis will be on man being created. So if your kids have got problems with ape men and all the latest stuff that appeared in the newspapers a couple of weeks ago and this, this so-called ape man from Africa that's just hitting the news, well, bring them along. It won't just be talk. It'll be like we had there. We'll be taking you outside the, the slides and that of all the evidence. So that's 7 o'clock Thursday night. Christ Community Church here in Franklin, and we'll have all these books if you didn't win the prize today. The, you know, the last one that I went to when you were here before yes. had hundreds and hundreds of reference books. It did, didn't it? Really, really good ones. And some great ones on dinosaurs, full color pictures for the kids, as well as the videos. Yes. And they'll be there as well for folks to see, because we, we don't yeah. apologize. We do our best to make sure folks know what's available and, and make use of it. Okay, and you have other videos. Now, this Jehovah's Park is available. What are some of the other videos? Okay. Okay, we have um, a video called The Origin of the Races, which we talked about last time I was on the program, uh, where we look at all the natives from around the world and have their stories that point back to the Tower of Babel. We have one which has primarily been responsible for opening the doors into schools. It's a debate called the Education Debate, and if folks want to see how little evidence there is for evolution, they want to hear the four professors who are on that debate try and defend it. And we, we had a real victory that night, and it's opened the doors into so many public schools. So don't forget, folks, pray for that, particularly tomorrow and for the schools here in Tennessee next week. It's just a great opportunity. We have um, videos on uh, the ape men, you know, one that's really great for young people on the ape men. And um, we, we, we keep going with... Um, material that deals with questions that teenagers ask. We had a two-day seminar. We put on video all the common questions that teenagers ask. And in fact, if folks want a complete list of all of these videos, can we put our phone number up now they can ring? I think we better. We'd probably better. So this is Creation Research. It's 615-374-3693. Uh, don't be worried if you just get an office answering machine. I don't think there's anybody there at the moment. But yeah. uh, there's our phone yeah. number, and they'll get back to you. Just leave your name and number and address, and uh, you'll get a complete free list there. Or write to that post office box, 281 Hartsville, Tennessee, and uh, we're available there uh, most of the time. You are one of the most fascinating human beings I've ever met, I think. I know you have four children, and you told me they're singers, not geologists. That's and, true. Uh, well, well, they're all delightful young ladies. I'm looking for four husbands out there, too. Oh, I see. At okay. The so all, they can, all I guess they can write to that address, too. <laughs> okay. Well, they start at 12 and go to where? 20. 20. All right. Well, it's good to have you good. back, John. Good and thank here. you for bringing in all of these fossils and... and um, I've, I've been teased over the uh, earphone here by Steve Bates out there that said it looked like a fossil holding a fossil, but uh, I've enjoyed this this morning. We're, we're going to uh, have some people on the rest of the week here that are fascinating, I think, too, and that's Taryn Edwards tomorrow is a singer and a songwriter. Kathy Fields with the uh, Christian Airline personnel people are going to be with us, and on Thursday,
Thursday, European, European press has dubbed this man the Rock Priest. And uh, he is a Christian minister that is so unique, David Pierce. He'll be back with us from Holland, and we hope that you'll be back too. We love you, and we thank you so much for watching today. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye. Dinosaur. Uh -huh. <laughs> Look at this terrible little book on it. Cold bloodedness, it doesn't apply. They're totally wrong. This is a warm bodied creature. This thing doesn't live in a swamp. This thing's got what, a 25, 27 foot neck? Brachiosaurus 30. Mm -hmm.